Hello. In this session, uh, I will introduce uh, you to the uh, key steps involved in the design process to create a very large scale integrated circuits, uh, digital systems, VLSI IC systems. When we think about VLSI IC systems, we think about uh, maybe complicated uh, integrated circuits, uh, such as the one depicted here that uh, could implement a microprocessor or maybe a router or a video codec. Um, and um, in this session, uh, we will talk about all the key design steps required to actually realize and implement uh, such a design. Uh, there are two major types of design, uh, one after another, um, in that they are required in uh, the entire design flow of uh, VLSI IC digital systems. Uh, that is the front end digital IC design, that is the front end design, as well as the back end design. Um, the front end design, as we shall see, is concerned more about um, uh, describing the logic, the computation, the algorithm that is implemented by the circuit. And the back end design is concerned more about uh, ensuring that the actual fabricated device, the actual semiconductor uh, wafer based device, actually functions and performs all the logical computations as. Uh, that was, as was modeled and uh, verified and demonstrated by the front end design part. Okay. Let's just first talk about uh, the uh, a little more detail, the steps involved in the front end IC design. In the front end IC design, uh, the designer starts with a uh, specification of the circuit. The circuit, the digital IC needs to do some task or some set of tasks and the designer starts going about uh, designing maybe a state machine uh, as you can see illustrated graphically here a state transition machine algorithmic uh, state machine uh, a load store machine like a microprocessor so you know uh, uh, the design is actually uh, first described at a very high behavioral level that is the level at which you are just sort of describing the main uh, major tasks without worrying about how this would actually be um, implemented in terms of logic gates and this circuit description is actually done this behavioral circuit description is actually done using hardware description languages or hdl models so we create a behavioral hdl model that describes the key task um, that the circuit will actually do and um and a, a, a model with greater complexity is called the register transfer logic or rtl model and the rtl model is actually a step down uh, trying to add more details to the behavioral model where uh, the circuit is now described in terms of uh, values or, uh, or logical values that are, uh, are, are set into a set of registers like what is the sequence of logical values that are updated and under what conditions are they updated uh, into uh, registers or flip-flops. Now the reason we uh, the designers actually design at the high level HDL model is because most uh, modern VLSI digital circuits are overly complex today. It is uh, virtually impossible uh, or extremely difficult to be able to design such a large scale circuit with so many interacting parts uh, uh, using only digital gates. So a higher level of description typically using HDL is necessary needed. And uh, modern computer-aided design or CAD tools um, uh, uh, play a very big role in helping uh, this design process because uh, the way uh, these behavioral and RTL circuits get um, converted into a, uh, a low-level logical description is through a tool known as a, a tool which goes through a process known as synthesis. So the synthesis tool will take the HDL model, the high-level behavioral or mid-level RTL HDL model of your digital design and convert it into a gate level model. So the gate level model is a circuit description also using the HDL or hardware description language like Verilog or VHDL, but uh, the circuit is now not described in terms of these register updates or in terms of a behavioral updates, but it's described in terms of the connections between elementary logic elements like your N or NOT gates, your multiplexers and flip-flops. So uh, com uh, the front-end IC designer would uh, design at the behavioral RTL model, apply a synthesis CAD tool to get the gate level model. And then there are uh, a, a whole set of steps, uh, verification steps that need to be performed to ensure, number one, that the behavior and RTL model actually meet the specifications of the design 
And number two, the gate level model that was generated by the synthesis tool is equivalent to the behavior RTR model and the gate level model also meets the specifications of the design. This is because the gate level model is the model that will be converted and implemented as a circuit at the semiconductor wafer level. And the verification process, uh, there are two main and complementary approaches to verification. That is to ensure that the behavior at RTR as well as the gate level models meet specifications and are equivalent. The first approach, which is what is widely used in industry, it's called functional verification. And here, uh, uh, in order to verify proper functioning of the gate level model or the behavioral and RTR model, we select and, and feed into the circuit a whole set of inputs and a whole set of sequences of input uh, bits. And then we check the output bits at intermediate parts of the design that is output at certain parts of uh, at parts of the logic gate output as in flip flops and we check that these outputs actually match um, the uh, ideal values that they are supposed to have right so we, we give a set of test conditions as a, a sequence of test inputs we know what the uh, test output is supposed to be um, for given these test inputs and then we compare the outputs generated by the hdl model the gate level model and to see if they are correct if they are correct um, then the design is said to uh, pass functional verification. And there are, there are, there are different concerns, dif different degrees of uh, depth in which you can do functional verification. Of course, the best is if you can test the circuit under all possible con conditions which we can run, but this is not possible, not feasible, because the sheer size of the circuit, you're not possible for you to test all possible combinations of inputs and output sequences. So what we do is we uh, try to select representative patterns, representative test input sequences that cover the majority of uh, functions that this particular design will see in real life. So uh, this is the, 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 uh, the field of uh, test coverage that is designing the appropriate set of uh, input test patterns, the input patterns, uh, test inputs that uh, can exercise the majority of the functions that the, 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 the design is supposed to do. And we also uh, uh, are able to, uh, we also try to, uh, designers also try to uh, add random inputs to actually enlarge coverage. Uh, and uh, the tools typically used to uh, perform functional verification are called test benches. So they are uh, simulators with uh, some uh, code that uh, that actually um, specify what are the set of inputs and in what order these input sequences should be put into the uh, gate level model and uh, which uh, output pins or which intermediate um, uh, gate and flip-flop outputs should be studied. The second approach to verification, which is a complementary approach, is the formal verification approach. Formal verification takes a different view of uh, verification. Uh, it's not concerned about specifying or, or stating specific inputs that go into the circuit. Rather, it tries to formulate, it tries to convert the gate uh, level HDL model into a mathematical representation and uh, the uh, mathematical representation. And uh, the designer then has to specify a set of uh, limitations, uh, a set of constraints. So these are sort of like mathematical constraints, but really they're just constraints saying that, okay, the input signals will not have these kind of patterns or they will, uh, it's, these input signals will always have these kind of patterns or, um, uh, or these sets of patterns will not co-occur. So it's a, a specification of uh, the expected operating conditions, the expected operating patterns of the input bits and uh, this is specified through assertions, cover points and constraints and the formal verification tool will then try to uh, convert, as I mentioned, the gate level HDR model into a mathematical representation, solve it uh, for the given constraints and show that under these constraints it would actually be equivalent to the behavioral and RTR model or it would actually meet the uh, performance uh, specifications, um, the specifications given uh, for the design. So front-end IC design is, con in summary, is concerned with uh, the design of behavioral and RTL models 
the conversion of these high-level behavioral RTL models to gate-level models, and the verification of RTL and gate-level models to, to ensure that they are equivalent and that they meet specifications. Next, we shall move on to uh, describe uh, the uh, main tasks involved in the back-end IC design. So after the front-end IC design, uh, we end up with uh, what is called a gate-level netlist, that is a file with a .edif or a .v for very long, uh, 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 a .v uh, kind of uh, ending, right, for the file name. Uh, and a gate-level netlist is nothing else but a text file that tells you what are the elementary logic elements used? And there is a name, a unique descriptor for every single end gate, not gate, multiplexer, flip-flop that is used in this design. And the gate level netlist also specifies the connections of every element to every other element. That means it describes every single wired connection between these basic logic elements. And the uh, whole goal of backend IT design is to convert the gate level netlist into a geometrical design uh, called the layout geometry file on the lower right of the screen here. And the layout of the geometry file is simply a specification on the width, length, thickness, height, and positions of the transistor wells, the uh, transistor gates, uh, and the metal uh, wires, the metal and polysilicon interconnects that connect all the transistors so that they form logic gates and they start building up the flip-flops and they start building up the entire circuit. So this is given schematically here where you can see the green regions actually correspond to the doped uh, semiconductor wells, the P wells, the N wells, and um, the, the uh, red, uh, pink, and uh, blue, and the cyan uh, lines are actually the metal or polysilicon layers, which is the connections um, between uh, the logic gate inputs, uh, the transistor inputs, to actually make this circuit. So uh, in the process of converting a gate level, net, gate level netlist to a geometry file, uh, the, the CAT tools also play an important role in this automatic conversion. Uh, and after the conversion, the backend IC design process also tries to verify that the logical um, function of this uh, physical geometric circuit on the right is equivalent to the gate level net, net list. And this is known as the logic equivalence check or LEC. Uh, this is because uh, when we start creating the geometry file, uh, we introduce additional non-ideal parameters, such as if you look at the wires here, the, 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 the uh, metal layers here, the, the pink one, for instance, he has a, 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 he has a finite length, a finite width, a finite thickness, and this introduces additional resistance and capacitance, which adds delay, uh, delay for the signal to cross from one gate to another, okay? Whereas in the gate level netlist, uh, such, uh, such wires uh, are considered to have no delay. So these additional delays may actually uh, be significant enough if one is not careful in the design process to cause the circuit to fail. Okay, without further ado, let, let's uh, uh, go through the main steps of the back-end IC design. So this is called post-gate level logic synthesis. So the logic, the gate level logic synthesis generates a gate level net list, which is a listing of all the basic logic elements. Uh, that is the flip-flops, the logic gates, the multiplexes, as well as the connections. Okay, and the first step of the backend IC design, the tool needs to, uh, to place, to position every single logic element onto the uh, the uh, silicon wafer, the, the, the portion of area, so that, that there is a targeted size, uh, a targeted area on the uh, silicon wafer that is devoted to this particular digital IC. And the tool first needs to decide uh, flip-flop uh, uh, NAND gate G1 needs to go at these particular coordinates, NAND gate G2 needs to go at these particular coordinates. And of course, it places the actual wells, uh, the actual P well, N well of the uh, NMOS and PMOS devices directly. And this is the placement step. So after the placement step, whereas all the standard cell logic elements have been placed, and standard cells are actually uh, basic logic elements, elementary logic elements that are given by the fab fabrication house, the, 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 the fabrication house, and they have characterized and their specific sizes, specific geometries. So after this is placed, there, there is another step where additional circuit blocks, complementary circuit blocks must be also placed by the tools or sometimes in a semi-manual fashion. And the reason for this is because the 
um, HDL, hardware description language, very long VHDL this design process does not um, permit the, uh, the specification or insertion of um, um, other more analog type blocks. And this uh, has to be also inserted to make the, the design complete. And after the insertion of all these blocks is the fi uh, final step called the routing step. Here is the, the process where the tool automatically tries to give the uh, best arrangement of uh, metal gates to connect, uh, metal layers, uh, metal connections to connect uh, each and every gate input to each and every other gate output and inputs according to the gate level netlist, right? So you can imagine this is not really an easy process. It's not a straightforward process. And it's not even guaranteed that you will be able to obtain a gate level, uh, a, 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 a fully connected uh, circuit for a given uh, area constraint. So the tool tries to actually find uh, this. So because why you can imagine that once you lay a wire down across connecting one uh, region, one uh, logic element here to another one, you can't place it another wire overlapping that unless it's at that second layer. And you only have a limited number of areas per layer and a limited number of areas. And you have to try to make all of this work um, in that, that in, in all of this work so that your design can fit the smallest area possible. So uh, the back at IC design process um, is comprised of three major steps, uh, which is heavily assisted by tools, but it plays, uh, is, an, is important for you as the designer to understand the role and function on each of these tools so that um, you can actually uh, identify errors and you actually know how to fix them uh, if they happen. The first is the placement step. The basic, uh, the elementary logic blocks are actually placed on uh, specific coordinates, specific locations in a wafer. Then additional blocks are placed and we will talk about these blocks later. And the final step would be the routing, which is uh, all these elementary blocks are connected to each other. Uh, and the, the actual dimensions and connections and position of the connecting wires or the metal layers are uh, created according to the gate level netlist. Uh, moving on, let's describe a little bit more what are the additional blocks that are added um, before the routing step. The first set of blocks would be uh, memory insertion. This tends to be static RAM, random access memory. Uh, and this is for caches or maybe sometimes for registers because uh, the uh, SRAM uh, memory blocks uh, tend to be more, uh, tend to require less transistors than a full flip flop. So they may be actually cheaper to, to implement. Uh, the second type of um, logic that uh, needs to be inserted are what we call the uh, design for test logic. The most basic example is what we call the scan chain. So if you're not yet familiar, uh, in modern digital uh, systems, the number of uh, physical pins of the chip is way, way, way less than the number of gates and the number of uh, uh, logical wires, uh, number of wires that are contained in the chip. But uh, you know, many things can go wrong in the fabrication of uh, an IC because the dimensions are so small. And uh, once ICs are fabricated, we need to test them. And once uh, we test them and we find there's a fault, we need to be able to localize the, the location of the fault. Where is it in the design? Which logic elements are faulty? Which flip-flop is faulty? So scan chain is a, a way to, to work around this. Um, um, all the flip-flops within the design are connected uh, in a shift register fashion so that um, you, know, you can actually input a bunch of test inputs in. You, you clock it once and uh, this, the circuit actually evaluates everything. And then you can read out all the contents of the flip-flops of every single flip-flop in design by sequentially and serially outputting it over a pin. So the infrastructure to do this is called a scan chain. What happens is for every single flip-flop, a multiplexer is inserted at the input that allows uh, you to choose between uh, the inputs that are specified in the design versus uh, the scan chain that is the, the connection to a previous flip-flop. And just as depicted by this graphic here on the lower left slides, uh, each box is actually a flip-flop. And here is uh, the, the colored lines are actually the tools attempt to actually trace the route um, and the connections needed to connect all the flip-flops into a scan, uh, a shift register. And uh, besides scan chain, we also um, can uh, insert more uh, complex design for test logic that is such as additional registers to record certain values uh, or maybe some uh, test points or 
uh, logic analyzer points or even some automated test pattern generators and checkers within the circuit. Uh, the third set of circuits uh, of, of uh, wires or connections that are automatically inserted, uh, these are the clock synthesis and the I.O. insertion. So um, most modern, almost all modern digital uh, designs are state machines and state machines means they are implemented with flip flops and all the flip flops share a common clock. And as you can imagine, um, it's called a synchronous state machine because all flip flops must change, must update at the same clock age. But if you start uh, uh, having a, a very long connections, our flip-flop connected to the clock with one flip-flop connected to the clock with a very short connection and the next flip-flop with a very long connection, it is entirely possible that the clock edge might arrive at the second flip-flop much later than the clock edge arrives at the first flip-flop. So the flip-flops now become out of synchrony. They are not synchronized and this has the capacity to really cause the design to fail. So clock synthesis, in clock synthesis, the tools and the designer tries to really balance and control the length of the, uh, the wires connecting all the flip-flop inputs to the clock in such a way that you can actually manage the delay so that all the clocks, uh, all the flip-flops see the same clock edge at almost the same time. Uh, the second uh, issue would be in uh, I.O. insertion. So you know that, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, there are only a limited number of I.O. pins, and these I.O. pins tend to be much larger in size than uh, the digital input pins. So there needs to be an appropriate circuitry to actually isolate and sometimes to even buffer the uh, I.O. pins, uh, the input and output pins to the actual digital circuit because you don't want um, electrical activity from these large I.O. pins to actually end up damaging your digital circuit. So there needs to be additional circuits that, uh, you know, they are, they are stereotyped, they are standard, they can be placed automatically by the tools. And lastly, um, none of these uh, logic elements run on air. Um, so we actually need to create the uh, connections of each transistor, each logic gate to the appropriate power and ground connections as well as to put in the appropriate power and ground planes. Uh, and uh, here we are actually concerned about trying to minimize the resistance of each and every power and ground connection because if you have an unduly large resistance, uh, this would actually cause a significant voltage drop across your logic gates which may also cause, cause your logic gates to fail. Okay, so uh, these uh, uh, four types of uh, circuits are actually inserted uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, back end IC design process before the routing process. Now, after place insertion and routing is completed, you will get a geometry file, um, a layout geometry file with typically a .gds or a .oasis uh, extension. Okay. And this is nothing else but a file that describes the position, uh, the coordinate positions, the dimensions of uh, the N wells, uh, the P wells, the uh, metal layers, individual metal layers. And these are the actual dimensions that we use to actually fabricate uh, the IC in the semiconductor fabrication house. But there are still a series of checks that need to be performed to ensure that this particular geometry, this particular circuit will work after fabrication. The first of these steps is called the parasitic RC extraction, where the tool, uh, given the geometry, the dimensions, the thickness, the length, the width, the height of all the metal layers, tries to estimate the parasitic resistance and capacitance of every single wire connection between logic elements. And the reason for estimating the RC properties of every single wire is because you want to rerun the static timing analysis. That is the analysis to check what is the maximum minimum delay between pins, what is the maximum minimum delay between uh, flip-flops to ensure that the logic elements, uh, the, the logic data is calculated uh, with, within the um, time period of the clock cycle uh, and with respect to uh, the setup and hold time. So this ensures that the synchronous state machine is going to be working reliably and will not be violated. That is static timing analysis. And if there's an error in any of these steps, the layout um, or the uh, place, uh, the, the routing has to be redone. And sometimes even the placement might need to be redone or the area might need to be, be enlarged. Uh, the third set of checks would be signal integrity checks where the tool looks at uh, neighboring and parallel wires, uh, um, uh, uh, metal layers, to check if there's a significant crosstalk uh, between them because this it represents a noise issue that is one rapidly changing uh, digital line may actually influence and add noise that may actually disrupt and corrupt the bits of a neighboring line. 
Of course, there's a whole slew of checks known as physical verification. And here we're actually really, really just concerned about the shape and dimensions of um, all these uh, connections as well as devices to make sure that we haven't uh, unexpectedly created um, some other functional structures or some other you know, functional uh, uh, functional um, structures or some other functional uh, um, uh, specifications that may actually cause the design to fail in the actual fabrication process. The first of these is called the design rule check. Uh, here, this is actually looking at all the uh, constraints on the layout, on the dimensions, on the positioning that is imposed by the chip technology. So what we say about technology, we talk about a process, let's say a 10 nanometer process. This is called a 10 nanometer technology. This is um, a, a series of processes and um, basic units that uh, perhaps are created by a particular fabrication house. Okay, that is, a, that is with transistors and logic gates with minimum gate, uh, gate length of uh, uh, 10 nanometers. Okay, so for, for this small size and for a particular fabrication house, there are certain rules about uh, the minimum spacing between uh, wires, the minimum sizes, the multiple of sizes of the uh, transistor gates, and maybe even the shape the bend, the curvature, the sharpness of the edges. So they have all these rules that need to be obeyed. Why? Because the Fab House in uh, establishing this 10 nanometer technology, this 10 nanometer process has uh, rigorously characterized the repeatability and robustness of, their, their, of these, these uh, geometric structures. And if these rules are followed, these design rules are followed, uh, if these geometrical rules are followed, then uh, this really maximizes the uh, chance that the circuit will be functioning properly, will be robust uh, during uh, after fabrication. The electrical root check or ERC is concerned and is a concern about uh, detecting open or short circuits, uh, you know, throughout the circuit uh, and any kinds of and the quality of the connections from power to ground. Uh, the antenna root check is actually a very interesting um, uh, side effect. So uh, the way these metal layers are uh, are actually fabricated is uh, the uh, metals actually uh, deposited on across the whole layer and then uh, um, you, you start to apply a mask and using that mask uh, you you use a chemical etch to actually remove parts of the chemical uh, of the metal layer and then what remains is actually these metallized geometries here uh, the process of etching especially if you're using plasma may actually cause damage to the transistors because the uh, plasma which is a uh, uh, high uh, high temperature ionic charges may actually accumulate on uh, you know uh, incomplete uh, or not really connected uh, metal layers here or polysilicon layers here. and if sufficiently large number of charge accumulates above uh, the the gate of any PMOS or NMOS transistor, it may cause a dielectric breakdown across that transistor. So the in the fabrication process itself, antennas will actually this antenna rule check is trying to avoid destruction of the uh, NMOS and PMOS transistor in the process of fabrication itself. Uh, there is, oops, uh, let me go back. There is another uh, class of uh, physical verification, verification that is the layout versus schematic check, or this is otherwise known as LVS. This is just a process of actually converting the laid out uh, geometry file into an equivalent circuit and then comparing that equivalent circuit in terms of uh, accuracy, in terms of correctness to the gate level net list. And XOR checks are actually checks done between metal layers because uh, you know in the process of actually uh, doing the back end design, there may be multiple, uh, many, many, many tens of iterations to correct uh, routing, um, uh, lack of routing uh, closure, to correct timing, uh, static timing violations, to correct signal integrity violations. So. Uh, the tools will be used to regenerate and regenerate over and over again different and different metal routes and sometimes at a single layer. So uh, the XOR check is done. It's just to, 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 to as a sanity check to, to, to see if uh, a particular metal layer is, uh, is the same as the previous version or has been updated and things like that. And finally, the phase shift marks and optical proximity correction are basically checks done um, to, 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 to make... Uh, uh, these uh, geometric designs compatible with uh, modern lithographic tools. So as you are probably familiar, uh, lithography or light is actually used in combination with the mask 
to actually create these geometric patterns on the semiconductor wafer. But uh, the minimum feature size, uh, the diffraction limit of uh, light itself is on the order of about 100 and 90 to 200 nanometers at extreme UV. And today we are capable of manufacturing transistors at least 10 times smaller than the diffraction limit of light. And the way we are able to do that is we're able to play this kind of signal processing tricks. Uh, we, are, we, we, we actually try to fit in a distorted pattern um, into the mass and after going through the mass and with the effects of the light, you actually get the uh, desired pattern uh, imposed on, on the uh, uh, semiconductor wafer. So this phase shift mass and OPC, optical proximity corrections, are actually looking at uh, this kind of, uh, the, the, the validity of this kind of uh, warping of the patterns, the geometric patterns. Okay, with that, uh, we have completed our introduction to the um, main steps in the design flow of VLSI digital IC design systems. There are two main uh, design uh, stages, that is the front end design as well as the back end design.